What's up, guys? It's Liz Kelly. Throughout the month of December, we are writing a ton of year-end reviews on the site, ranking the best and worst moments of 2018 in music, TV, film, and sports. You can check that out on TheRinger.com. Also, make sure to listen to the two latest additions to The Ringer Podcast Network. We've got Villains with Shea Serrano and Winging It with Vince Carter and Kent Bazemore. You can subscribe on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. A young lawyer joins a prestigious law firm only to s- discover that it has a sinister dark side. The Firm, coming up next. The lawyers at your firm sure seem accident prone. Four dead lawyers out of 41 in less than 10 years. I think you've got a serious problem. Paramount Pictures presents Tom Cruise. They can get to anyone, anywhere. In the motion picture suspense thriller of the year. What are you doing here? If we run, they find us. Based on the number one bestseller. Your life as you know it is over. The Firm. Now available on video cassette. All right, Bill Simmons here, Sean Fennessy here, Chris Ryan here. We've circled this movie for a while. I didn't want to do it. I was a reluctant volunteer. It kept po- you planted the seed. I laughed. Yeah, this is months ago. Like the firm, why would we do that? That's not a rewatchable. And then it, then cable just started showing it over and over again. Yeah, I think it's on Showtime right now. I kept getting sucked in, and then last week the tipping point when I realized it was a rewatchable. My wife got mad that I was watching The Firm again. She's like, what is it with you in this movie? I'm like, I don't know. It's just, it's a long movie. I missed this part. And then I was like, ah, oh, we got to do it. I've watched it so many times that uh, now it it, uh, it has to be done. Why do we like this movie, Sean Fantasy? I'm so glad you succumbed to our I desires succumbed. here. It was a succumbing. It was really amazing. Uh, I think it's weirdly a perfect rewatchables because it's not a perfect movie. That's not the point of this show. It's a movie that is really fun to talk about that has so many things going on, that has so many relevant people doing things in it. And it's a story that is a good plot but has a lot of flaws. That's fun to talk about. And it's got a peak, 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 peak Tom Cruise. Yeah. And I don't know. It's just it's a, it's a great time. And it's like easy to watch closely and it's easy to watch barely paying attention. This reminds me of, this, it's not going to make sense, but The Firm kind of reminds me of Heat within mm. the context oh, of God. rewatchables. <laughs> Sprawling. Because it is equal parts entertaining and eccentric. There's a lot of idiosyncrasies in this movie. There are a lot of choices being made in this movie. But at the end, it's a really, really good thriller, right? Yeah. So I think that you can watch it so many times because every time you're like, A, that guy's in it. But B, that guy's in it doing some really extra shit. And, you know, I I just found myself completely taken away by a different element every time I watch this movie. What was your memory of when this movie came out? Because to set the context for the youngers out there, Grissom, John Grissom. Grissom, not Marquise Grissom. Grissom. John Grissom. (laughs) Is it Grissom? It's It's John Grissom. It's Delino DeShields wrote this novel. Should I do a maze and have an edit here or just ride by mistake? We got to roll this. Roll tape. Only Robert Mays is the only one who gets redos at the ringer. (laughs) I'll just own my mistake. John Grisham. <laughs> Grisham? Grisham, yeah. It's, John it's, Grisham. You say it how it's spelled. John Grisham. <laughs> you just pronounce the H. Who is Grisham? Did, Jermaine Grisham? Was there a point here? Football. Were we going somewhere with this? Yeah, he was a very big novelist. Yeah, he was. He was. <laughs> in the early 90s yeah. and was having a moment. And I remember I was in college, summer 91, maybe. And it was just like everybody's reading John Grisham books and had an opinion on the firm. And it was one of those rare books where you just knew the movie was coming. Mm-hmm. It was like, wow, Mitch McDear. I, I can see this movie in my head. I remember being slightly disappointed by the movie in the theater walking Had out. you read the book first? I'd read the book first. Cruise was Pete Cruise at that point. There were a lot of expectations. Gene Hackman, I think we all love. There's just a lot of people in it. And in my head, this was like, this is going to be the greatest movie experience I've had this year. It wasn't. And I belatedly came around to it. I think that makes complete sense. I mean, it's it seems like a very, very, very Tony important movie because it's a big adaptation of a popular novel, but as Sidney Pollack is directing, it's got David Rabe and Robert Town writing the script. It's got, you know, incredible composer, incredible uh, cinematographer. It feels like it's supposed to be like a big, important like Oscar movie. It got a couple of Oscar nominations. Sidney Pollack, when yeah. he was still really meant something. But it is just like a Hollywood thriller. Yeah. And- you know, even though we just did all the President's Men, which is kind of the pinnacle of a Hollywood thriller, 
a movie like this about a lawyer can really only be so good. And I think if you modulate your expectations on it, you can really enjoy it a lot more. Well, you mentioned it's a movie about a lawyer. He never goes to court. It's true. There's no real interesting law being practiced here. This is secretarial work. His this job interview. Work. Yeah. His job interview. It's like a courtroom scene for a brief second. That's about the. And it's like, oh, this is cool. <laughs> Mitch McDear's doing law. Yeah, that's, never, that's never as does close it again. as you get to a few good men. Yeah, but uh, I, I think that that's the the thing about this book was I remember reading the back of it, you know, in 1993 or, or 1992 or whenever it came came out. And they're like, oh, it's a guy who finds out that the law firm he just joined is really a front for the mob. It must be just completely thrilling. Yeah, dead bodies left and right. And this is like, I think the Washington Post uh, critic who reviewed it at the time it came out was like, this is the first Xerox thriller. <laughs> this is the thr- right. first thriller that's essentially about people making copies. Yeah. I, uh, I remember- it's really entertaining. <laughs> you know, Part of the problem when the movie came out was it was too close to the book. And I think sometimes that can be bad. I remember Presumed mm-hmm. Innocent was another movie like that. Everybody had read the book. And then the movie came out and the big reveal at the end, which in case anyone's never seen that movie, I won't give away. I already knew the reveal was coming. I read the book. So at, at some point you're just limited by people's histories with stuff. Now, The Godfather had the same issue and became the greatest movie of all time. So it's not like it's crippling, but um, I did think it hurt the movie when it came out. And now- for somebody like Kaya, who's producing um, the rewatchables for us, who didn't know what the firm was until five minutes ago on Wikipedia, not a problem that that she didn't even know there was a book. It's funny you use Presumed Innocent as an example. For me personally, for my exact age, Presumed Innocent is the perfect movie that I, there's no way I read the novel because I was yeah. probably like six when it came out. Right. But I saw the movie and had my head blown off by the ending. I was like, this is how you do it. This is a really fun Hollywood thriller. Nobody, this, nobody in the moment felt that way because we all read the book. Right. This movie, though, I had read the book, even though I was really young. I remember this very vividly because I read probably the first six or seven Grisham novels because I remember my folks were splitting yeah. up and I was going on a lot of car trips to visit my dad. And I was always kind of back and forth in the this car. This is why fantasy and I get along so well. Children of divorce. And the car trips. The car trips thing. And I was I would the, the burn children through. Of Grissom. Yeah. The, I would burn <laughs> through those books, though. And I read The Firm. I think I got out of the library when I was like 11. And... I do remember that exact feeling you're describing of like, this is very close. A lot of these, a lot of the Grisham adaptations are very similar. Would you say that that started your lifelong love affair with overbilling? Uh, <laughs> there was one, I, there was a, we should talk about Grisham. He's so interesting. There, what, my, I remember my favorite one being on a long car trip to North Carolina about like a tort lawyer. Do you guys remember this one? Did you read this? <laughs> it was like Rainmaker or is it? No, it was like mid to late nineties. I can't even remember the name of it. It was probably... I hope it wasn't called The Tort Lawyer. The nobody, Tort Lawyer. I don't know if I saw that one. <laughs> was it The Partner, maybe? I can't the remember what it was. was. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people talk there about was it. so much tort law in yeah. it. It was so confusing. Um, but anyway, yeah. I don't know. Grisham, his movies, were, his books were incredibly readable. Like, you could read them in, in six The Firm hours. was the best one. Yeah. I, he did a lot of good ones. But The Firm was just one of the best books of that decade. Just everybody read it. It was so easy to read and so rich and you could kind of see at that point, Tom Cruise had done enough Tom Cruise that you were like, Oh, Tom Cruise will be Mitch McDear. I don't even know who else would have been Mitch McDear at that point. I don't know who else he was competing against. There were a couple of people. We'll we'll probably talk about that. that were potentially up for it. Right. Yeah. And it would have been a mistake. Yeah. Including one. We'll get to that later. Uh, You know, they say like, I think we've talked about this a lot, especially when we do movies from this time period about this idea of like, they don't, Hollywood doesn't make movies like this anymore. And I I was thinking a little bit before we were recording about what that means for this one. And I do think that this is a really adult movie. Yeah. You know, I think that a lot of the things that happen to the characters are relatively adult themed and it actually winds up being quite violent in places and it's quite complicated in places. And I think what what we kind of are referring to, and you know, I'm imagining young 11-year-old Sean Fennessy reading this book or seeing this movie a couple of years later. And it's like, we make movies now, or Hollywood makes a lot of movies now that are made for the largest possible audience. And that's great because like you get these mass entertainments, you get Black Panther, you get these movies that, that are really great. But And Robin Hood. And Robin, then you get a Robin <laughs> Hood. The firm was really like, it's kind of a take it or leave it movie. I mean, I, as a young kid, I didn't understand a lot of the stuff happening. And that's what I kind of remember about this era of movies, you know, is like they were still making movies with the talent from that 70s era. It was just on a bigger scale somewhat. Yeah. 
and I think that that's sort of what we kind of miss about this time period. Am I make, making sense when I'm, you know, like... Yeah, Disclosure was like that too. Yeah. They would make these really complicated movies and they didn't totally care if you didn't understand it because they had major stars in it. Yeah, it's very um, Entertainment Weekly core. You know, like yeah. whoever was the star of that movie was on the cover that week. And Grisham was like a perfect example of like, you could read the review of the movie and then there would be a and a with him about the adaptation of the movie. And it didn't really matter if the movie made all that much sense to you. I mean, when I saw it, it definitely didn't make sense to me. Rewatching the scene at the end of this movie with Paul Sorvino, where he's like explaining his scam. Yeah. I was like, what? Yeah. Is that really what this movie is about? <laughs> and I guess it is. And, he, and then there's the whole exposition done with Ed Harris that we'll talk about too. But uh, it's, I think it doesn't matter that it, it's so complicated. So the book came out in 1991. Film released uh, June 93. Released the same week that the top six paperback spots on the New York Times bestseller list were evenly divided between John Grisham and Michael Creighton. Which is a tough beat for John Grisham because I know that he had been working on some really cool novels at that time, so. <laughs> Made uh, $158 million domestically, $111 million internationally, the largest grossing rated R movie of 1993, two Academy Award nominations. So, just talk about this now. This is also the same year as Jurassic Park 2, speaking of Michael Crichton. I it's mean, a that, really weird movie year. There's there's a lot of big-ass movies, and none of them were 100% satisfying except for Jurassic Park. Yeah, I there's mean, There's a lot know, of, like, Sleepless in Seattle. and It's Schindler's all, List. All, Sh- Schindler's List was kind of the big, that was the awards mm-hmm. film of the year. So, Holly Hunter got nominated for an Oscar for this movie. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Ever plug one of these in, only you forgot to put the water in? No. You know what happens? No. The lights go out. <laughs> she was uh, on screen for a total of five minutes and 59 seconds. It's one of the record shortest Oscar performances. And she's in 20 scenes for an average of 18 seconds. She... Um, is blowing Gary Busey in 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 under the desk, and he gets gunned to death. That is accurate. It's one of one of one of her most iconic scenes. She got nominated for an Oscar. Yeah. If you watch this movie and you're like, "Who's the one Oscar nominee?" She would have been like the twelfth pick. I don't know. I feel like she's kind of killing it. She's doing for a lot six with minutes? a little bit. Yeah, for an Oscar. Think about what that scene on the page is when she come when he comes into the office for the su- first time and she's like, "Have you ever plugged one of these things in without water?" You know, <laughs> I mean that's like the, she's doing so much with that material. I th- there's a couple of different moments like that when she comes in and she gives him the sandwich yeah, and the she's egg like sandwich. 245, and, and then later on in the when um David Strathairn's character is on the boat and he's like, "I love your crooked mouth." And she's that like, that's not great. my best part. Like yeah, that's everything that's happening yeah. between them is so good. That's, I don't know. Is she's it Oscar kid. good? Yeah. I, sure. I don't know. I mean, who is she, who is she up against? So who lost out? So this led me to go. Wait a second. Who else was in this category? Okay. It is the all-time train wreck of an actress in a supporting role category. Oh boy. Anna I, Paquin won for the piano. Yes, which I'm fine with. The other nominees were Holly Hunter, Rosie Perez, and Fearless. Oh yeah, I love her in Fearless. Winona Ryder in The Age of Innocence. Yeah. Holly Hunter in The Firm and Emma Thompson in The Name of the Father. Whoa. Oh, shit. Really weird category. I forgot she was in In the Name of the Father. Me too. But then what's Uh, weird is- That's not so bad, is it? That feels like 1993 to me. Actress in- No, it's bad. (laughs) Actress in a leading role, Holly Hunter beat, uh, for the piano, she beat Angela Bassett as Tina Turner, which is kind of an outrage. Uh, Stocker Channing at Six Degrees of Separation, who's incredible in that movie. Emma Thompson, The Remains of the Day. Deborah Winger, Shadowlands. My point is, Emma Thompson and Holly Hunter nominated in both categories. Has that, that ever year. happened before? It's, it's got to, I mean, I'm sure it's happened, but it has to be less than I've 12 nev- times. I've never heard of it. What a weird year. I've never heard of that where two actors were nominated in two separate acting categories in the same year. Yeah. Actor, just this is now tangent territory, but supporting actor. Tommy Lee for Fugitive. Elite. Leo, Gilbert Grape. Overrated performance. Ray Fine, Schindler's List. Yeah, great performance. John Malkovich in The Line of Fire. Yes. Incredible, incredible shit. Incredible performance. And Pete Postlewaite. 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 In The Name of the Father. It's Pete, Hanks it's pronounced for Pete Grisham. Hanks beat Daniel Day-Lewis, Lawrence Fishburne, Anthony Hopkins, and Liam Neeson. Loaded. Loaded. Anyway. <laughs> 
Interesting year. Yeah, weird year. So Holly Hunter, anyway, she got nominated. This film cast included two Oscar winners. Can you guess them, Chris Ryan? Two Oscar winners. Hackman. Yeah. Holbrook. Holly Hunter. Oh, okay. I thought you meant before that. No. Five Oscar nominees. Can you guess the five? You have Holbrook. Holbrook, uh, Hunter. Yeah. Ed Harris. No, so she's, we already counted her. Oh, five Ed, more. Ed Harris. Yeah. Uh, Tom Cruise. Cruise. Yeah. They're born on the 4th of July. There's two more. The last two are tough. Did Triple Horn get nominated for Basic Instinct? Or? No. No. <laughs> um, no. Busey was nominated. Yes. For, wow. for uh, Busey is the, the an Buddy Oscar Holly nominee. Movie. Did David Strathairn ever get nominated? Yes. David Strathairn, yeah. Bang. What was it for, though? Was it Eight Men Out? Yeah. One of my favorite that guys. I don't, I don't even Strathairn? think. Strathairn? Yeah. Chris is a huge David I'm a Strathairn huge, guy. massive fan massive. of his. The firm, he's actually, it's a, I think, the most likable in the firm because it's really kind of a nothing part. Oh, it's just behind bars. Part. It's also completely against type. It's yeah. so different from we'll any that, character he plays. Seen in, when, they, when he goes and first sees him in jail and he's just like, it's all right, I wouldn't want to visit me here either. Yeah. He's like making it really easy on him. I'm like, oh man, this is just such a great like job. I thought he was really, I, I, Eight Men Out is an interesting movie that is held up and he's the best person in it. He plays the uh, pitcher. Cusack's good in it too. Cusack's good, but he plays the pitcher who can't decide whether he wants to turn or not. I remember when the really first time I saw Eight Men Out, I was just like, I can't believe this guy's to pitch every day. <laughs> <laughs> Because uh, that was the thing. It's like you were just the starting pitcher for yeah. the White Sox. <laughs> Roger Ebert, three at, three stars out of four for the firm. That sounds about right. Yeah. Said this movie is virtually an anthology of good small character performances. Uh, I want to point out the Tom Cruise run he's about to go on here. Please do. 92 The Firm. I'm sorry, 92 A Few Good Men. 93 The Firm. 94 Interview of the Vampire. 96 Mission Impossible. 96 Jerry Maguire. Mm -hmm. And then strong. Two consecutive lawyers. Yeah. And then he yeah. somewhat reunites with Sidney Pollock in Eyes Wide Shut. <laughs> right. <laughs> he does. Some That's of the best scenes the, in that movie. Yeah. I didn't tell you guys the rewatchables list for uh, 2019 yet, but Eyes Wide Shut is on it. It's a it's a six hour podcast. That might be the most uncomfortable I've ever been in my life is when we do that. And watching listening we to you that. talk about Eyes Wide Shut <laughs> will be so disgusting. I can't wait. <laughs> we should put it on YouTube and do a live rewatch with the uncut version. Oh you know, where the, none of the bodies are placed. All right. <laughs> Bendini, Lambert, and Lack. Mm -hmm. That was the name of the law firm. Um, Good Cruz, be. this was the last time he played this guy. This was a character that he played probably six, seven times in different forms of the cocky guy whose life is headed somewhere but then he gets derailed by this and now he's got to figure out how to solve it mm. i think this was it for him after this anecdotally i think that probably starts a little bit earlier but this features the first time i remember especially it's usually a, uh, a female character taking time out of the story to just say like what an amazing person tom cruise is like to his face where you know, like when Gene Triplehorn's like, you have no idea what moves me about you. You know, like there's like a moment where <laughs> we break down. It's like a lot of this movie is just about how fucking incredible Tom Cruise is. Yeah, amazing. And that really starts to become a hallmark of Tom Cruise movies going forward, especially in uh, in Mission Impossible. You know what I mean? Like that's like especially a factor in a lot of those movies. But yeah, I was struck by that where I was like, everybody is constantly blowing smoke up this guy's ass about what a miraculous lawyer. And or husband he is. He always does well, though, when he is underdog, wet behind the ears. Yeah. You know, I was thinking about this even with, like, Edge of Tomorrow. It's when he's at a down moment is when he does really well. You know, that's the Jerry Maguire thing all over again, too. And it's, so it's funny. And Few Good Men, too, you're like, you think he's fucked and he doesn't know how to solve the case. That's Obviously, it's a character arc that is created in a lot of movies, but he's particularly good at it. But I don't really, the, like cocky hotshot version of him like I've never been a Top Gun guy I've never been interested in that version of like the cruise mythology I'm much more interested in this kind of guy though? not my thing as much I mean hey, I think it's a great like movie he's the cocky hotshot this movie he is but he gets like he, he gets really, quickly knocked down he gets dunked yes. on pretty fast he gets kneecapped really quick yeah some would say he should have known he was getting kneecapped totally. a little earlier which I'm sure all the we'll signs are there let's do the categories most rewatchable scene I really only have one you guys can add some, but when he goes in and he goes into Gene Hackman's office and he's like, I got to get some files from Avery. They're like, cool. And he comes out and Hal Holbrook's like, hey, can we talk to you for a second? 
And then Brimley's coming down. We we have a lot of Brimley to get to. <laughs> so Brimley's sad. coming in. He's like, "Come on, Mitch!" And then he gets the call from Ed Harris. And yeah. Ed Harris is like, "Get out of there!" Hello. Get out of there. They know. Get out. Did you hear what I said? Get out of there. Get over here now. That 15 minutes, I'm watching every time, and that's really why this is a rewatchable because. That stretch of like, he's running, Tom Cruise running, he's jumping. There's a, a truck that miraculously has pillows for him to land on. Ridiculous. He's on a, he's <laughs> on like a, what are those things? Monorail? Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Then like a walkway. tram, it's a tram, yeah. Then the guy from Breaking Bad and the other Dean bad Norris, guy, they're, yeah. they're chasing him and then he ends up in the thing and then he's hanging for it. It is, un, it's so good. Great chase. It really carries the movie. It's literally Sidney Pollack doing Three Days of the Condor like 20 years later. Yeah, it's just him so doing good. a thing that he is one of the best at. What else would you have? I really like him guessing his uh, his salary. I know that that's- uh, That's a really good one. It's a pretty minor dramatic scene. No, it's good. But it's, it's one of the only opportunities we get to see him and his intellect at work. What precisely were those instructions? But you were in great demand, and I should make certain that we obtain your services before a bidding situation developed. How did you go about making certain? <laughs> I uh, bribed a clerk in the Harvard Law Placement Office for the exact amount of the highest offer, and then added 20%. You know, I mean, he figures out a way to get out of all of this without getting disbarred at the end. But I always love the like when he turns it into a, a court proceeding and Hal Holbrook's the judge and Terry Kinney's like the uh, defense lawyer. Yeah. So I, I love that scene. I also think the scene where they go down to the Grand Cayman and Hackman and Cruz are talking to Jerry Weintraub who's playing Sonny Caps. <laughs> and like they show what how, why Mitch McDeer is such a great lawyer because he's able to convince this crook to like take some tax loophole. Do you want to talk about, can we talk about that now or later? What he says to Sonny Caps? Let's talk about it now. Okay. So the line and, and forgive me, but like, I think <laughs> I'm doing this right. But the line is you're going to feel like you were fucked with a dig, a dick big enough for an elephant to feel it. I don't know that like when he says that line, I'm like, has Tom Cruise ever cursed in real life? <laughs> At all. Like, I stumbled over it because this is like a live read that where you're like, did a robot write this? It's so uncomfortable the way he says it, but they play it pretty well. That's been a lot of the cruise experiences. Has he done anything in real life? Yes, I know. When he plays sports, when he drinks, like the way he, he does the Vin Diesel drink where he tilts the beer too high when he swings from it. Like he <laughs> doesn't realize you can just casually drink it. The other I don't know is, if he's done a movie where he smokes mo cigarettes, but he would be terrible at that. In this movie, he also, when he prepares, when Gene Triplehorn comes home and he's gotten the job offer and he's got the, like the Chinese food feast, the way he d doles out the Chinese food is with this <laughs> fucking spoon and he's just like never had Chinese food before. So he right. puts like an entire carton of mushu pork on the plate. <laughs> and she's just like, mmm, a feast. And I was like, dude, nobody eats that much Chinese food in like that way. Like you're like, try just going to one Chinese restaurant. Well, he also, there's one time where he comes home and he just throws her on the couch and starts mauling her. And it's like, <laughs> nobody's ever done this in the history of, he's like, I'm so happy to see you. I'm now going to maul your face. It's like, what is it? What kind of relationship is this? This is what led him to eyes wide shut. He's such a strange guy. Because he didn't understand Chinese he food. He didn't understand anything. It's a key party. Or do they do these? It also, it also has uh, one of the great like non Tom Cruise sports moments where the beginning of the movie where he's like playing basketball oh, yeah, in the gym. Yeah, I have that locked. Okay, in. We, we're going to talk about that later. And, and the, the tumbling. Worst. Okay, okay. I won't, <laughs> yeah, I won't hold, on, hold that on, hold on. That I, I do love. I just love the Sunny Caps conversation. I love Jerry Weintraub like 15 years before Ocean's Eleven, just playing like a dirt bag talking yeah. in the movie is really funny. For some reason, I like. So there's this big plot twist which we can talk about later now, but where. Gene Triplehorn, Cruz's wife. It seems like she's just going to leave. She's bummed out. He cheated on her. He's got involved with the mob. And then she decides, no, instead, I'm, I'm going to go help him. I'm going to go to the Cayman Islands, and I'm going to go flirt with Gene Hackman and team up with Holly Hunter, who I've only known for two seconds, and this is somehow a great plan. This is one of the big flaws in the movie. But she goes to the Caymans. First of all, these movies always make these places look like the greatest places you could ever take a vacation, right? 
They go to the Caymans. It's just, it's super fun. Gene Hackman's there wearing a pirate shirt. Guys having, are wearing pleated having shorts. Having some mojitos. Yeah. It's just like the happiest, greatest place. It's what you have in your head when you go on a vacation. Yeah. And when you really go there, like it's raining and you get Montezuma's Revenge. But she goes <laughs> in and it's like this one time in Gene Hackman's whole life that he's been able to pull off the kind of horny older dude guy yeah. successfully. Yeah. It's always gone... Like Gene Hackman, and basically could be a Ken doll. Like he might even not have an anatomy, and I wouldn't be suppo- surprised. In Hoosiers, he's hitting on Barbara Hershey, and it's just like, wow, this is awful. Like, stop. In this, it's like I actually believe that he was making the moves on Gene Triple Horn. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. know how he pulled it off. He's, he's it was just, the one time he's ever very he pulled it off. Convincingly lovesick in this movie. Yeah, like yeah. when he's talking to his ex-wife and. He's like, I got to make myself look as pretty as you. It takes just, it takes me a little longer. It's, he's super flirty yeah, he's in a, a way vain, that actually works. Aging playboy. Seems like a yeah. real person. I mean, yeah. Gene Hackman always kind of seems like a real person. He doesn't always seem like a sexual person, right. but he always seems like a real guy. And that's part of why, I mean, we could probably do 40 minutes on Gene Hackman and how incredible he is. But even in a movie like this, which is like kind of a throwaway movie and his role in it is kind of complicated because he was uh, wanted to be as big a star as Cruz. He wanted his name on the poster. Yeah. You know, there's all this controversy around his appearance in the movie but he just like effortlessly is can be whatever you want him to be you know i like this movie for the gene hackman catalog because it's a side of him i've never seen in another movie it's basically like it's the only time where you wouldn't leave your drunk wife alone with gene hackman at the end of the night you would never feel that way with him in any other movie like i any other movie gene hackman i'm like gene can you drive my wife home yeah and this one it's like gene you're not driving my wife home it's funny what you said, though, about him being lovesick, because I think that is credible. And they have that great conversation when she does go down to Grand Cayman and they're sitting and he's kind of like explaining why he feels the way he feels and why he's doing what he's doing. But he's also like really creepy, like yeah. hitting yeah. on her at a funeral. And he, when yeah. he, I saw this moment in the funeral scene this time around where he shakes her hand and doesn't let it go. Yeah. And then you actually, I never noticed this before, but you see her like look down at the hand like what's happening here. And he's kind of like, he starts by being complimentary and then he's flirting and then he's being creepy. And you're like, oh, this is like a really subtly well-drawn scene of how this guy is completely crossing a boundary and knows he can get away with it because the person whose husband this is, is his protege. So like, it's not, he's not going to get any trouble for it. By the way, this character now would... uh Post Me Too, all that stuff. There's no way this character is even. Or it would just be an even more pointed example of mm-hmm. a thing that actually happens. Yeah. yeah, they just make him more of a character of yeah. himself. Uh, most rewatchable is for me. I don't know if you guys must agree. Is the chase cruise on the run yeah. is one. That's one of the best 15 minute sequences of the 90s. I will opinion. say I do love the whole. Well, we do least rewatchable scene too, maybe, but uh, the, yeah. the, just the whole scene where they're sort of like being wined and dined, I think is just really entertaining and is like really, it's a great edited montage of kind of him figuring out how to be a lawyer inside that firm, but yeah. then also her being exposed to like Terry Kinney's wife uh-huh. and all the, the conversations that they're having about where you're starting to get a little suspicious of the firm and what's yeah. wrong with the people here. That also just like plays really well. The first hour of the movie I find to be really good. And then it gets like really saggy in the middle and then it, and then it picks up again. Yeah, I agree with that. I also like um, the the ending when he goes back to his house and it's been demolished and his wife shows up. They actually do a pretty good job yeah. with that for the most part. Uh, and that we, uh, David, how do you say his last name? I've never figured Straight it. Theron? Straight Theron? Yeah. I was calling him David Straight Harn. <laughs> It's pronounced uh, David my Grissom. Pronun- <laughs> my, my pronouncing dyslexia. Uh, David Winfield. Him and Holly Hunter, that scene with the boat, and he says the crooked smile, and she yeah. says, that's not my best part. I was in for 10 more minutes with that couple. Seriously. And it's just like, I would have rather have had that than the 10 minutes seeing a cruise on the beach, which leads me to what's aged um, the best, and then we'll do what's aged the worst. What's aged the best? The soundtrack, which I remember was pretty controversial at the time. I, I'm the so glad to hear you say yes. that. So can it's we, great. Let's just talk about this because I, I I don't think we've actually talked that much about scores on this, this pod with the exception of maybe like Social Network. Yeah. It is a completely different character than the, in the movie. Yeah. Because if you just watch this movie with no soundtrack, I'd love to see it. It plays totally differently. This The piano, Dave Grusin's piano in this movie is constantly adding humor 
somber, a, a kind of somber melancholy. Romance. Romance. Scariness. Yeah, it's like, it's almost- the suspense is amazing. Always telling you, but like those like, and the way that like the themes will kind of come recur, whether it's somebody's playing, like I think the guy is playing guitar on Beale Street the night he's walking back and doesn't do the gymnastics, is playing the the the, the firm theme on the guitar. And just the that that romantic score that he does when they're cruising along when he first gets the Mercedes and they're like driving by the river. Yeah. And it's like, oh, this is like a really classy movie, you know? He's put this way, he's in the Who Won the Movie list. I, for sure. For sure. Has to be. Yeah. He's also one of the best scores of any movie last 25 years. It's so years. distinctive. Nominated for an Oscar. Yeah. I mean, this also, won. He made The Graduate. He made uh, Electric Horseman. Like he's, he made a lot of really good scores Some people didn't years. like it at the time, I remember. I think it's, it was it's a very, polarizing. It's very on the nose, but in a way that I find like fun. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. it actually felt like the way that the book is a very popcorny book where you just kind of keep going and page after page after page, the score, there's so much score in the movie, but I, I agree with you, Chris. Like it really guides you how you're supposed to feel through every scene in an effective way. Mitch McDear, just a great name. Yeah. That's aged really well. It's awesome. Yeah. The Cayman Islands as a locale just has always <laughs> aged well to me. Sure. Never been. Like, Have you ever been to the, the Caymans? Caymans? It's mysterious. It's where you hide is, money. I hear the rum is good. Yeah. <laughs> He, everything's good crazy things happen you might meet a girl on the beach with a sprained ankle you just don't know the Cayman so mysterious uh, <laughs> just great era of cruise the 90s cruise just this movie makes me forlorn for uh, how we don't have a person like that now unfortunately Tom Cruise still wants it to be Tom Cruise sure. but um, that actor who's just like oh this guy, this guy is in this movie I know what this is and I can't wait to see it it's just tough. It's a tough, it's a tough place to get to. I think as an A-list who is that actor. person for you now? Not to go I too said, far. I don't know who it is. Because like I, I really like Emma Stone. Like I want to kind of see everything Emma Stone does. She's in mm. this movie, The Favorite, right now. That is really interesting. Um, it's not the same thing that you're describing, but there is always like one person who you're like, I wonder what that person's going to do next. I wonder what like who they're going to, and not they're not going to like transform like Daniel Day Lewis. Like you're going. To go see them and be with them. To see, it's the season ticket people. Exactly. Who do you have season yeah, tickets exactly. for? That's a really good season ticket. Is a really good way of looking at it. I felt that way about Miles Teller from uh, Chronicle and Whiplash, and then it kind of fell off a little bit. You, uh, you gave up your tickets. I didn't give up my tickets. I still have. I still have stock. You know what I mean. But he's just been. He's been. I gave up that Damon stock. tickets when I didn't see downsizing. Yo, I love downsizing. Save downsizing. That's a, it's like my hottest take. I got, I'm going to write that piece in like 10 years. I think it's really good. <laughs> Listen, Damon on the podcast I do with him, I he's know. ready for you to write it right now. He still doesn't understand what happened. Alexander Payne is like one of seven geniuses we have as a director. And people were like, ah, eh, this movie sucks. That's, that was not true. That's, that's my take. Man, who do I have season tickets for? Very strong one. I like that take. Thanks. I feel like I don't have season tickets for really anybody anymore. Except Leo was the only one I was thinking. Mm. Just because when he makes a movie, you know, he's put thought into, I'm going to do this. He's still, he's the only one who's still got that special. He curates his own uh, IMDb the best. What's, what else is age the best for you guys? Anything? For me, the soundtrack's the winner, but I don't know if you have anything else. Uh, I guess the totality of the cast has aged really nicely too. It's just a lot of people who mattered in the same movie. I also think that the setting is really great. Uh, they use Memphis in a non-stereotypical, even though there's some like really cliched Memphis stuff in there, but the city's kind of empty. Uh, it it kind of gives this feeling of this fading Southern metropolis. And it has like a nice vibe of like when he goes and sees Ray the first time, and he's like, I'm across the river. It kind, you kind of have that feeling of it being in the, in, in that yeah. in the geographical like, location it is, mm-hmm. and I thought I think it works overall to give it this kind of like even in the beginning when he's like I know they're old fashioned it's the South they're just like killing them with kindness and it's it's it makes it feel kind of creepy mm. but there's something I think that like even with that and we can, we can talk about this at any point I guess I think that watching it again I realize one of the keys to this movie is that Mitch is supposed to be you know, experiencing this and then realizing slowly that like these guys are all, oh, there's something off about this firm and these guys. But when you rewatch the movie, you realize like, cause of Cruz and all the stuff we've already said about him, there's something off about Cruz and Abby. There's something off about Mitch and Abby too. Like they have a kind of weird relationship and they're kind of weird. And that's what makes it so good 
is because like they, because he is such a weird tryhard, and she is sort of like, I always knew you were gonna make this much money, and and that kind of vibe. But to it's her. like the Hollywood stereotypical couple. Yeah, but they're not. Oh, it's not that they're in over their heads. Like they are well drawn themselves, and they are idiosyncratic themselves. So well, it's, a, it's like a. I, I don't want to get too like socio political, but it's a great Clinton era movie because it's this like. I didn't come from a lot of money guy. Yeah, yeah. And Grisham obviously is a very like, I'm from the South. I'm right. self-made. I worked hard to build myself up and become important. And she's more moneyed and she's more of a like a Hillary in a lot of ways. And they're, they sort of work together to grow this ambitious lifestyle that they want to have. But then it reveals that like that quest for that ambitious lifestyle can be like a little insidious. You know, there's something kind of dangerous about like selling out your soul for profit basically yeah and she's always like i want to go back to like like our our one bedroom or our studio apartment and saving up money for a bottle of like kenwood wine or whatever and he's like i always like wanted to give this to you i wanted to give this to you it's like it has a good tension i so i think in a weird way that choice to make (laughs) mitch and abby as as kind of like well drawn as the evil in the movie is what makes the movie so kind of interesting totally you know the uh, that era though it was like children of the baby boomers and the baby boomers that was the first generation of like do you sell out or you keep staying yeah, to ideas that's a huge nineties like thing yeah. the big chill and all those yep. movies that came out and that you could still feel that a little bit in the early nineties this is like are you just gonna go try to make money or are you gonna try to do something good yeah it's people po- don't think that way anymore post Reagan like yuppie yeah. anxiety mm-hmm. going on and in, in and it's also like if you look at the people that wrote this movie like they're obsessed with those ideas like Robert Town being a product of those 70s movies, like is obsessed with that idea. David Rabe, the the playwright who wrote this, like he's all of his plays. Hurley like, Burley, yeah. Yeah, they all hit yeah. on striving people and the fucked up things they do to get to the top. Yeah. So it's really interesting. Like you you can do a much deeper reading, even though this is a really like popcorn flip. Yeah. What's age the worst? Wait, can I do one more thing that's age the best? Yeah, let's hear it. Um the foresight that they had with the character actors, not just with the people that were well-known, like Hal Holbrook at the time, which, you know, he's great, but we knew he was great when they cast him in the movie. But there's a few people, you guys already mentioned um, Dean Norris and Tobin Bell. They play the two the two heavies, the two, like, assassins. Tobin Bell went on to be Saw, and Dean yeah. Norris went on to be Hank in Breaking Bad. Um, you've got Terry Kinney, years before Oz. and Terry he- Kinney was in that uh, that that death battle with Will Patton for the same parts for Balding Guys. <laughs> totally. They just, I, he's a I huge, still don't know who's huge who. Chicago theater guy. Like he was. All the actors who come out of Chicago are like Terry Kinney is basically my like my god. He's also yeah. a great Mr. Fix-It on Billions right now. Yeah. Um, and, the, and the last person is Margot Martindale. Yeah. As his secretary. As his secretary. Yeah. Years before the Margot Martindale thing happened for real and she's like an Emmy nominated actress now. So like that's gr- that's classic Sidney Pollock stuff where like the 18th most important person in the movie is a great actor. That's, yeah. That makes that makes movies like this so much better. I agree. What's age the worst? It's 155 minutes. That's aged badly every time. <laughs> it's an issue. It's uh, it's just too long. And, yeah. and it really drags. The beach scene could have honestly been 10 seconds, the which is Karina the next Lombard? thing that, yeah, just he cheated on his wife. Let's get out. No, if, you have to show why he does it. You have to show him trying to fix it. And then you have to have her say, I'm like, I'm poor, you know? And he's like, yeah, me too. Eh. How about this? He's got drunk and he just hooked up with somebody. I like, don't think it works if it's a 90 minute movie. I agree. I think it's a two hour That's movie that for some reason is two hours and 28 minutes. Yeah, because Sidney Pollock is like, I'm not cutting anything. It's right. the first cut. <laughs> uh, it's the yeah. first cut of a movie. That was, your number, and, that was your number one reason for why you didn't want to do it. You were like, "There's it's 20 minutes, 30 minutes too long. It really is. And it is. It, it is. should be, I, you could talk me into two hours and five minutes. Yeah. Cruise, the, that whole beach scene, it's just not rewatchable whether it's essential to the movie or not. But as soon as it comes on, it's like, all right, I'll, I'll come back in 11 minutes. Uh, I don't need Cruz in his pirate shirt, which also has an age well. No, it's so not. We're in like the fucking John, John Tesh playing Pirates of Penzance, <laughs> uh, one of those shirts. It's really funny to think about what those guys like that are now. You know what I mean? Like the dudes who were at like, you know, clubs in New York and what they wearing dress that, like. Wearing that shirt. And in this, they're just like stuffing linen shirts into pleated pants and like kind <laughs> hey, of dancing awkwardly. Let's go. Yeah. Um, Cruz, sweaty Cruz playing basketball in the beginning. We don't even actually see him in a play. He's just kind of like somebody else is shooting and they cut to Cruz and he's all sweaty. He's like, what? What happened? And yeah. it's like, 
They they didn't even go through the charade of having him get one fast break layup or anything. So it really what do you it's think always is bothered Tom me. Cruise's best sport. Well, this is I mean, Tom Cruise's athletic ability is one of my favorite I think topics. It's, I think it's softball. I think I most believe him in a few good men at softball. Cornerback practice. was his most believable. Him as Stefan Georgievich in uh, all the right moves. Uh-huh. Like believable kind of a slot corner. Yeah. I think it's definitely not baseball. Because no. we've seen him throw a baseball, I think, in War of the Worlds. Yes. And also in Oblivion, he talks about baseball as if it's an, an alien structure. Yeah. Like he's, all of his it's lingo probably is probably awesome. like, In Oblivion, is it the Super Bowl he's talking about? Or maybe it's he the was Super like, Bowl. The Super Bowl was here. Yeah. <laughs> Thousands right. gather to see it. Yeah. <laughs> this would be a good ringer feature is all the times Tom sports Cruise is sports. intersected with yeah. Tom Cruise. He never was a wrestler though, right? Like for me, Vision Quest would have been like the greatest Tom Cruise role of all time. Mm. And maybe he would have done it because it's kind of a sexual movie and he usually steered clear from he that. He would have been but. a great, like, uh, especially with the way that he does a back handspring in this movie, like a Rey Mysterio style cruiserweight. <laughs> you know? uh, yeah. Well, that was another thing that's what's aged the worst. Tom Cruise doing back flips on the streets of Memphis. Yeah. And then setting up for the scene later when he walks by the same kid, but he's bummed out. He doesn't want to do backflips this time. I would. Pay, I have no idea why that's in the I would movie. probably pay like $1,300 to be in the editing room when Pollock was like, See, that's why I kept it tumbling in. Yeah. Because now you see that he's circles sad. back. Don't quit on this yet. It's, I'll come back to it later. <laughs> Guys, the gymnastics, it comes back around. It is an amazing example of just like horrible shit in a good movie. Like yeah. the yeah. minute he starts doing the gymnastics, um, it it immediately dates the movie. So like, first of yeah. all, it feels no longer classic. It just now. feels bad. All the yeah. shit would have fallen out of his pockets on Beale Street. Second of all, yeah. Gene Triplehorn says, there he goes, as if that's something he does. <laughs> yeah. The like, back we'll be guy. out and he'll just fucking Uh-oh. do a tumbling this routine. Bitches doing backflips again. Just, just turns into Mary Lou Retton all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just like, they're like, oh, this is delightful. What would you do if we were walking down Sunset with our wives and I just started doing flips? I would just walk into oncoming traffic. <laughs> I'm honestly trying to think of anyone I've ever met in my entire life, which is now almost five decades long. Who at any point would just start doing backflips on a sidewalk? No, eight year old girls like, do that. What are you doing? But not even on Why are you doing backflips? Also, like just like think about the street. Yeah, it how would, disgust- it would just be especially disgusting. Memphis. Yeah, and you tear like, your hands up. Yeah, I honestly think we need like a a, a deep slow motion <laughs> Kobe Bryant's detail style breakdown of the back handspring and how perfectly in unison he is with the kid who's doing it, right. who he's seen do it one yeah. time, one second he earlier. Also doesn't tip the kid. I don't oh, know if the rude. kid is doing it for money, but like he just high fives the kid and the yeah. kid's like, fuck yeah, <laughs> this guy just did fucking backflips yeah. with me. Double backflips. <laughs> Kaya, would you ever would you ever date a guy who you were walking in Memphis with him on a vacation <laughs> and he just started doing backflips with some random street performer? Absolutely. And then just kept going? Would that <laughs> would that intrigue you or turn you off? Absolutely not. <laughs> yeah. That I, me off. So that has an age well. Yeah. Kai's generation would not approve. But what's weird is my generation didn't approve. No either. one has ever approved. No it's not like Abraham Lincoln ever. was like, and here goes another man back flipping his way into a woman's heart. <laughs> While we're uh, talking about Tom Cruise in Memphis, I just want to mention uh, on a side note, he also has never eaten ribs before on the rooftop <laughs> at the party. He eats the rib where he's like, ha, this rib. Well, as is custom, I better get at this from a sort of top angle. And he like comes in over the top of the rib yeah. and eats it like a popsicle. And it's fucking disgusting. <laughs> You're like, what are you doing? It's like this meat lollipop instead of just like normal rib eating. If it turned out Tom Cruise was an alien all along, you wouldn't be shocked, right? I sure wouldn't. And he learned all of his human behavior through his acting. Yeah. He'd be like, oh, it's part now, of his it's charm, now I get though, it. It's not just Cruise, though. Like, what's age the worst? We could do a bunch of stuff with this movie. Like, when the scene when um, Ed Harris and the other FBI agent come into the diner late yeah. at night <laughs> and they order a steak sandwich. <laughs> on rolls. On rolls. And, and that sandwich apparently is ready within 35 seconds. Well, like, yeah. We'll get those to go. And then they walk out. Yeah. There's like, only three guys there. It's like three o'clock in the morning. How did they whip up steaks in 30 seconds? Well, probably it was like steakums. You know what I mean? Like, it's just a diner in Memphis. I agree with you, though. That I always thought about that scene where, like, also, if I was the guy, I'd be like, uh, all right, I'll get you your steak sandwiches to go. But it's going to take 11 minutes. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, you probably want just coffee. Also, you alluded to this. The, just Gene Triplehorn's plan going down to the Grand Cayman, like, 
how did she know what hotel he was staying at? Like, how did she get da- how did she get on a flight that quickly? You can't just like go to the airport and be like, Where Grand Cayman, Grand please. Cayman from right. Memphis, Me- Memphis to the Caymans, not direct. No. That whole that whole thing is bizarre. That's that's why I, one of the reasons I love kicking and screaming so much is it's this moment when he's like, I'm gonna get on a plane. I'm gonna go to Prague. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, and then she's like, "Can I see your passport?" It's like, "Fuck, I can't go." Exactly. Like, but that's what real life's like. In this movie, it's like, "All right, Memphis to Cayman." It's almost a five-hour flight from Memphis to the Caymans. Yeah, yeah. A lot of this movie's age is the worst, but I think that's why we love it the most. I mean, definitely. Let's be honest, Wilford Brimley, who we both love and who's going to come up in a second, but him as like your head of security slash. Kind of muscle. He's I, Wilford Brimley. I think all the <laughs> Wilford Brimley's gonna kick my ass. Well, I mean, and then when they kick Wilford Brimley's ass, I mean, we need to just do a Wilford Brimley section. I think. All right, we'll save that for a little bit later. I would say that all the plot maintenance they do in that last forty-five minutes, though, it's like uh, is is very like is like a lot of the FBI stuff when they're just like here's the stuff like to either like help the FBI along, like where they have the mob's itinerary. They're yeah. like, I'm looking at his, the Moloto family are coming. I have their itinerary in front of me. The fuck is, how do they get the itinerary for the mafia when they're visiting Memphis? It's <laughs> a great also, question. There's another, I mean, we're doing, nit, we're picking nits now too, yeah, but we, we might as well just go into all of it. But he gets the idea for the overbilling from the guy that they're overbilling. Yeah. And the guy just lays out the whole thing. And then Tom Cruise makes that Tom Cruise staring in the distance <laughs> face. Like, that's how I'll get him. Yeah. That part's really weak. That guy is a weird actor too. He looks like Eddie Murray, the baseball yeah. player. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, <laughs> like his performance is pretty strange. It's very strange. He's just like living exposition. I also, um, I don't know, like Gene Hackman just rolls over and he gets set up by Gene Triplehorn. She drugs. She him. drugs him. He wakes up, hears her on the phone, and then he basically just gives her the goods. He's not mad at all. Okay, I, um, I have a question. Yeah. Did, did they kill him or did he kill himself? I had that later for probably unanswerable questions. Did uh, Okay. Yeah. I don't, don't want to step on that then. Did Gene Hackman actually die in this movie? I have a very big unanswerable question too, so we should save that too. Okay. Okay. Um, anything else for what's age the worst? No, I mean, it's funny. It's a movie with like a ton of flaws, but- I mean, there's so many to choose It's from. so great, you know? Like it, it, that's- that's like the best part about the show is like, you don't have to, this doesn't have to be Citizen Kane no, I know. for it to be amazing. Hey, let's take a quick break to talk about the Ringer Podcast Network. A couple podcasts to cover. The Big Picture, Sean Fennessy's relatively new movie podcast. If you're listening to this, you probably at least like Sean Fennessy. Maybe you tolerate him. I don't know. But uh, a bunch of Golden Globe stuff from last week. Interviews with people like John Krasinski, Steve McQueen. Thoughts about the top five Westerns. Thoughts about top 10 films of the year. That was the recent one on Friday. So check that out if you love movies. Also check out The Watch with Chris Ryan and Andy Greenwald for the very, 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 very best of pop culture. And then Channel 33 where you can find all of our, not just celebrity culture stuff, but uh, really thoughtful podcasts, The Press Box, Damage Control. That is all on the Ringer Podcast Network, not to mention Binge Mode, wrapping up the Harry Potter series very soon. And speaking of the Ringer Podcast Network, new edition, it's called Winging It. The correct title is Winging It. I I don't know why they didn't do the apostrophe and just call it Winging It, but uh, Winging It. Annie Finberg, Vince Carter, Kent Bazemore there on the Hawks. They did an unbelievably fun and entertaining podcast this week with Steph Curry and Andre Iguodala that if you like basketball... I don't know how you would live with yourself if you didn't listen to this. It's really, really entertaining. Uh, I was just delighted by it this morning, listening to it. Anyway, check that out. Check out all that stuff in the Ringer Podcast Network and check out theringer.com, the world's greatest website. All right, back to the rewatchables. Casting what ifs. Jason Patrick turned down the role of Mitch. What are you doing, Jason Patrick? <laughs> Come on. Jason I, Patrick has a couple of swing and misses in his life. A scant two years later, he would appear in Speed 2 Cruise Control. Yeah. When did Julia Roberts leave him at the altar? Or did she leave Earlier. Kiefer Sutherland? She left him for Kiefer Sutherland. Right. It's No, she left Kiefer Sutherland for Jason Patrick. I tried to find out why they went to Jason Patrick before Cruise. He was so hot for a second with Rush. Rush. Yeah. I People know, thought but he was going to be the next Pacino. 
I, I'm there. I'm with you. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, how does Cruz end up in? Like, did they really? Jason Patrick turned it down, well, and then they're Cruz like, "All right, also, let's go to Plan B." The I think biggest Cruz is actor super in the world too. So, do you think that's what it was? It was like I they didn't want to be surprised if bullet? he was making whatever the twenty million. You know, I mean, like, I'm sure he was the he's the biggest star in the world at that moment. Gene Hackman joined the film late when it was already in production because the producers had originally wanted to change the gender of the character and cast Meryl Streep. Until John so a Grisham, movie. it's a completely different movie. Objected, yeah. Well, in the movie now, you don't. It's actually a better movie in a weird way because now you don't have to have the scene on the beach and you just have Cruz sleep with Meryl Streep, and then that's how you get the blackmail. And that's but then that what happens in the last forty minutes of the movie? I don't know. It's yeah. just I just it's shorter, Maybe which would be my only movie. goal. I I really don't think it's a better movie with Meryl Streep. I mean, I think it's weird to be like, don't put Meryl Streep in your movie, but Hackman is one of the reasons why this movie makes sense to me. You like, don't think Meryl Streep would have been equally awesome, though? I think she's uh, she's always awesome. Like, it's not really about that. It's just the kind of person that Hackman is feels like the kind of person that could continue to lure Mitch into his web. You know, like, that's a really important part of it. And if they tried to, and I understand the idea of, like, gender flipping that kind of character, but the fact that there are no female attorneys in the firm is Except like Except for, like, the one that died. The one that died. All right, that but, makes but sense. She a lot like Meryl Streep, actually. She does, yeah. Yeah. It made me think, though, I wanted, I wish Meryl Streep had played a character like this. Well, yeah. She was I, doing I, I like was some about blockbuster I don't know if stuff she around ever, then because she's in River Wild right around now. But then. she never did like the, what that character would have been. Probably like an older, divorced, sexualized, I'm going to use my appeal to try to get you to do what I want you to do. And mm-hmm. then I'm also a bad person deep down. I don't feel like she's ever played that. I think you're right. That's interesting. That would have been a good one for her. Yeah, that is a cool, that would have been a cool part. Sydney Pollack um, was the one who wanted to do that, and it fell through. So and Grisham really didn't want it, right? Isn't that isn't that part of why? It yeah, didn't Grisham happen? and Grissom. He was against oh, it great. too. Okay. Robin Wright turned down the part later taken by Gene Triplehorn. I feel like you could say that about almost every movie we do on the show. Like they went Wright. to Robin Wright, and she said no. <laughs> Well, that's what like when I reran the podcast I did with Goldman a couple of weeks ago, and he was basically like, "She should have been the biggest star in the world and didn't want it. She just wanted to like raise a family with Sean Penn." It's a good what if. Halle Berry auditioned for the role of the young woman on the beach who seduced Mitch. The Karina Lombard. Oh, yeah. Wow. Interesting. I would have been more into it with Halle Berry. I'm extremely pro Halle Berry. Yeah, especially that era Halle Berry. That sure. Was boomerang Halle Berry. The Dion Waiters Award. Wow. Got an hour. Wow. It's Brimley Qualify is my first question. Uh, well, y- yes, right? I think he does too. Yeah. So. so if he qualifies, he wins. David Straithorn. <laughs> Bill. <laughs> <laughs> Holly Hunter definitely qualifies. She was yes. in there for six minutes yes. and got nominated for an Oscar. I'm throwing Paul Sorvino in there just because I love that he played a mob boss again. Me too. It's great. Two, yeah. two, three years after Goodfellas. That is a real CTC. His agent was probably like, do you want to play another mob, mob boss? He's like, I've, I've moved on from that. And they're like, it's Sidney Pollack and Tom Cruise. And he's just like, tell me where to show up. Yeah, everyone's getting 500K minimum. Who's just the guy the in the cast. room? Who's his partner? He's yeah. one of those guys. Yeah. Just one of those. Yeah, he's in like he's Mickey Blue Eyes and yeah. all those yeah. movies. Yeah. Classic, that guy. And then uh, Busey. I think that's your top five. Busey's trying a little hard. Brimley is like a, his own planet in this movie. I could talk about <laughs> Brimley in this movie for an entire other podcast. Well, now Brimley is the time is his own because planet. Yeah, it's Brimley. Uh, we all orbit Brimley. You know, it's not. It's not the other way around. He's not a supporting actor. Brimley is the winner. Oh my! It's God. amazing, Brimley. Imagine her one day opening that. Devastating. Not just screwing, Mitch. But the kind of intimate acts, oral and whatnot. It could be particularly hard for a trusting young wife to forgive and impossible to forget. It's just astonishing. I have so many questions about the Brimley performance. Let me start here. Gene Hackman was five years older than Wilford Brimley in this movie. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> How is that possible? <laughs> Isn't Brimley today only like 71? Yeah, Isn't Wilford there's... Brimley, he was 49 in Cocoon. Oh, God. And when he did this movie, he was like 56 or And it'd something. been, for me and Sean's era, we just knew him best as the Quaker Oats guy. Yes. And the, the manager in The Natural. You're yeah, the best goddamn hitter yeah, I ever saw. Yeah, yeah. Suit up. Yeah. He seemed like he was 80 in that movie. 
I mean, this is not original ground trading. I can't believe Wilford Brimley isn't older, but I can't believe Wilford Brimley isn't older. Yeah, it's crazy. In the natural, I thought he was like, honestly, I thought you told me he was 70. I would have believed it. And he is one of those guys, much like Gene Hackman, who seemed to have been born at age 50. And there's never like, I actually looked last night for young Wilford Brimley photos. There are none. He didn't start <laughs> acting. He didn't start acting until the early 80s. He was already in his 40s. Okay, picture this. Brimley and Hackman switch roles and Brimley tries to seduce Triple that's, Horn. That's oh, not man. working. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, do your Brimley impersonation, Chris. Well, it's Jeff Chow. Our, our, the president of our company, Jeff Chow, is one of one of the great gifts he's ever given to me is when he would he walks into my office and he says, imagine you're Abby going down to her mailbox looking for her red book or sharper image catalog. And what does she find, Mitch? Heartbreak. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff does it way better than I do. And but that whole real. fucking scene in the catalog where he's just like, these kinds of, we're talking about lovemaking, Mitch. <laughs> Well, that's not a not, not a fling. Yeah, it's like it's just so weird seeing Wilford Brimley show Tom Cruise pictures of Tom Cruise having sex on a beach <laughs> while the albino guy from In the Line of Fire hangs out. Right, <laughs> and it was also so unexpected because Wilford Brimley had not been a bad guy in any movie. And it's yeah. like, wow, so he's the bad guy, Wilford yeah. Brimley. He brings an edge to this movie that is so unexpected. Where he's like, I'm not the fucking Night Watchman. You know what I mean? Yeah, and, and then like. Even in that last stretch of the movie, where like he, the whole thing hinges on whether or not the fax machine has paper in it, and he's like, "What's the matter with you guys? There's this thing's out of paper." Right. <laughs> it's just how is that? What this huge blockbuster movie is based on? Wilford Brimley checking a fax machine for paper. Where is this? <laughs> yeah, he uh, he's super crusty. Um. Really good bad. Like, I'm actually kind of scared of Wilford Brimley in this movie. Yeah. So like, don't fuck with Wilford. He's imposing until Tom Cruise he, falls on him yeah, and then kills, he kills him. him. He falls on him and then he kicks the shit out of him. Yes. And yeah. I still to this day am traumatized by it. Cause like I feel like Wilford Brimley could have let the like dinosaurs from Jurassic Park loose in Central Park. And I would still be like, don't kick that guy. Come on, man. Yeah. Like he kicked and he's just like, you sick son of a bitch. And he's like, so here's my unanswerable question, I guess. Is does Tom Cruise kick him to death? I think so. He, I had that for later. Did Wilford Brimley die? I, I don't think, think he, he was, died. I think he was groaning. I think you could hear him groaning. Okay, because he's end. like Tom he's Cruise gets away pretty scot free, and I still think he would have had to deal with some manslaughter charges if if Brimley's heart goes out there. Yeah, he. Um, I don't think he killed him. I think he definitely had a concussion. He was definitely not allowed to play in the NFL the following week. <laughs> he ha- had some broken ribs. Well, he and, was only twenty six at the yeah, time, so he yeah. probably could have played left tackle. Gene Hackman, five years older than Wilford Brimley in that movie. That's absurd. I'm not even How sure is that if possible? I trust that. Are we are we picking nits at this point? No, we're not there. We're well, we're we're going with Brimley. Do you right? have any other Brimley thoughts? I don't. I don't know what I could add to what your performance. That was what, what did she find, Sean? Heartbreak. <laughs> <laughs> She's looking for a sharper image. Sharper <laughs> image catalog. <laughs> in eighty and ninety two, are we still like waiting for the sharper image catalog? I guess Brimley was. He le- he carried himself like somebody's stepfather <laughs> that the stepkids hated. Whereas like, oh shit, he's home. Oh man, he's gonna make me do stuff. Everything that scene when which start which leads to Cruz running when he comes in and Holbrook's staring him down, and Brimley comes in with that, and it's just like, oh, he's gonna kill Tom Cruise right now. Like yeah. I actually really believe. Oh, that. I forgot. I forgot what the actual second line there was. Oh. Not just screwing, Mitch. All sorts of intimate acts, <laughs> oral and whatnot, that can be particularly hard for a trusting wife to forgive and impossible to forget. <laughs> <laughs> it's disturbing. Wilfred. Uh, All right, Brimley. he's the winner. Brimley worked blue. Yeah. Who the, knew? Jo- the Joey Pants Award. Some possible nominees. We know who these people are. You but say we mentioned- what the Joey Pants Award is. Just so, because people get confused sometimes between... The Dion oh, Dion Winters. Winters. Jo- oh, the Pants. Joey Pants Award is Joey Pant- Joe Pantaleone used to be a that guy. He'd be like, oh, that guy. And then well, he eventually you, became Joey Pants. His name is Joe Pantaleano. Joe Pantaleano. <laughs> okay. I was just, I was talking fast. Okay. I know his name's Joe Pantaleano. Um, it's Joe Grissom. But be- well before he became Joey Pants. Yeah. He was that guy. Yeah. Yes. For basically the entire 80s. And 
we try to figure out who is the Joey Pants of this movie. We're we'll like, oh, I love that guy. Now, okay, this is an interesting question about this category. Is it that they were a that guy at that point and then became a guy we knew? Because this movie has a lot of those. It could be that, or it could be, I never knew who that guy was. He's, oh. I always feel like that version of that guy trumps the other one. So okay. Terry Kinney, former that guy, but I feel like he's Terry no, Kinney. I, I think that there's actually like a pretty, I have a really good one for this one. Terry Kinney, uh, David Straithorn. No. Uh, Paul Sorvino. Those are all people Those are we know. Academy Award nominees. You the, can't, guy, the guy next to Paul Sorvino. Yes. He's my personal choice for this, with the runner-up being Hal Holbrook's conciliary. Jerry Harden. Royce McKnight is who he plays. Royce McKnight. Yeah, but Those are the two best Joey Pants guys yeah, in this So movie. Jerry Harden was literally in every single thing in the world for 20 years. He was in Big Trouble in Little China. He was on Dallas. He was on Family Ties. He was in The Twilight Zone. He was in Little Nikita. He was in, uh, gosh, I mean, he was he's in- very, He's well known for The X-Files. The Did you say spot, he was in 48 Pacific Hours? Heist. He was in Matlock. Was he in 48 no. Hours? He looks like he should have been. D- he's deep throat on The X-Files. That's, that's when he became more of a known person. He's in fucking Reds? Yeah. Jerry Harden. I never LA knew his Law. name. I gotta be honest, I never knew his name. Melrose Place. Plays Dennis Carter. Can't totally remember who he was on that. Hmm. Half-ass internet research. You mentioned Gene Hackman's name did not appear in the film's release poster. Tom Cruise's deal with Paramount stated only his name could appear above the title. I had the same deal with the rewatchables. (laughs) Hackman also wanted his name to appear above the credits. This was refused. Mm. Hackman said... I want to be removed completely from the poster. His name does appear in the end credits. This Gene is, Hackman. This is this is Chris's take on the rewatchables. He's like, I, my name is either next to Bill Simmons or I'm not above on the, the title, or yeah. I'm not on this. Or Chris Kyle will be like, I'll settle for the. Takes. I'm on the left lower, and you're in the right higher. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm like Dave Grusin. Just playing the keys. Don't Just wanted to credits. mention <laughs> the ending is significantly different from the book. In the book, he swindles ten million from the firm and gets one million of the two million from the FBI, and there's a manhunt and a whole bunch of stuff. And that is not how it plays out in the no. movie. Jean Triplehorn, when she was making this movie, do you know who she was in a six year relationship with? I have no idea. Ben Stiller. Brimley. No? Okay. <laughs> Brimley would have been a good answer. Ben she dated Ben Stiller for six years. Didn't know that. Yeah. Uh it's it's not weird to be like I was just in love with Gene Triplehorn in the '90s, right? That's that was a common feeling. Oh, not weird at all. Okay, and um, I feel it, like it would have been more like, weird if you weren't in love with her. Okay, she's but she's like weird, a weird like '90s Mount Rushmore for me. Oh yeah. Oh, that that that's still not weird. But okay, uh, I, okay, so maybe it's just my experience and I wasn't having a lot of Triplehorn conversations. But like, she really just stands out as like a face that I can't shake. If she had been Bruce Willis's girlfriend in Pulp Fiction, much better movie. <laughs> totally different movie, in oh my boy. opinion. Maybe that wins the Oscar at that point. Okay. Well, should have had a great her. podcast. She's, She's somebody whose career may. Do you think she just never recovered from Waterworld? It was a better career no, than she, you think it was. She's had a good she, career. She did she a lot on, of good stuff. She was on Big Love for six Big years. Big Love is what she became famous yeah. for. But she she was in a lot of good stuff. She had a great career. She was just like. Oh, like a really foxy, beautiful actress, but also always evinced like really intelligent, strong woman in all of her in all of her roles. Like she had a really good career from like eighty eight to ninety seven. She one of my theories with leading actresses because the parts are so bad, um, especially if you go back eighties, nineties, two thousands. They really are in about three good movies, and then they kind of they become too expensive, and it's just easier to shove them aside to have the next person mm-hmm. who's like Mitch, what's wrong? Um, and she was in that revolving door, and usually they land on some TV show eventually. Like yeah. Amy Brenneman's another example. She was in a lot of movies for like four years, mm-hmm. and then Holly was like, "All right, we're done with her. Let's get the next one in." Yeah. And uh, I always thought Jean Triplehorn. I think she was better than Holly Hunter in this movie. Is my hottest take. I think she's really good in this movie. She is very. good. I don't think it's an easy part. No, I think, she, and she's also a very like you. You know, like her character is just really unique. Like. I feel like I just, I get a sense of who Abby is from her. When she shows up in the Caymans, it's a little hot messed up. Yeah. She looks great. That's right there good. to seduce Gene Hackman. What do you think, what do you think of the scene where she runs out of the house and then he sprints after her? It's so weird. 
It's not bad. They just Cruz contractually had to sprint four times at every movie at that point. Why is he running so hard he loves after to her? run. Where is she going? Right. She's going down the driveway. <laughs> He's running so hard in the I middle know. of the night. I know. It's like she's Flojo. <laughs> the voice the voice of the prison warden on the phone informing special agent Ed Harris that a prison guard sent an unauthorized fax. Sidney Pollack. Yeah. Did you know there was a TV series called The Firm in 2012 that picked up with Mitch McDeer 10 years later and was on for an entire year? No, I did know. I Mitch think I McDear. blocked that out of my mind. Nah, I don't want to talk about it. Let's pretend it never happened. Okay. The hotel in the Cayman Islands was the Hyatt Regency Grand Cayman. He oh. actually says, take me to the Hyatt. Destroyed in 2004 oh. by Hurricane Ivan. Sat vacant for over a decade, rotted away, and was eventually demolished. Sad. That sucks. All right. So I did some Gene Hackman recon uh-huh. as part of half Fast Internet Research. When was the last time Gene Hackman's been in a movie? Don't look Don't look this up. The Moose thing. It's Welcome to Mooseport. I believe it's 2009? 2004. Whoa. 2004. Who did they try to get Hackman for? What did they try to get him for? Gene Hackman hasn't been in a movie in almost 15 years. I forget. You're right. There was a movie that somebody tried to get him to come out of retirement and he wouldn't take the part. We accidentally killed Gene Hackman at Grantland. Great moment. Which is traumatic for all of us. But we wrote a piece about him. Stephen Hyden wrote it. He did. And the headline made it seem like he was dead. And then it became a thing. And people thought Gene Hackman died. Guess and it actually, wrote, I didn't feel like we did anything totally wrong. It was just. Guess who wrote that headline? Who? You're looking at him. Sean Fantasy. Yeah. So on Twitter, the headline made it seem like he died. It got retweeted. And it then, was Facebook where it blew up. Oh, And Facebook. we always talked about how like we didn't really rely on Facebook that much for traffic at Grayland, but that was like one of the most popular pieces in the history of Grayland because people on Facebook went crazy because they thought Gene Hackman died. The last year at, that I was at Grantland, Facebook was very important for us. And drove a lot of traffic. Especially when we, when we were fake killing wonderful actors. Yeah. Quentin yeah. Tarantino wanted Hackman to play the Robert Forster role in Jackie Brown. He oh didn't do God. it. That was Gene Hackman was like, though. I still hadn't forgiven you for the French girlfriend in Pulp Fiction, so I won't be in your film. <laughs> I mean, she's fucking terrible. I don't blame him. So I did some Gene Hackman Googling to see, A, is he still alive? B, is he healthy? C, has there been any sign of him whatsoever? And I found this thing. All you could find was that Graylin story. Beisling.com, but January 1988, or I'm sorry, 2018, Beisling.com, a whole article about Gene Hackman bought an electric bike with a picture, <laughs> with a picture of Gene Hackman. I thought you said Bison.com. No, Bicycling. I thought you were going to say Gene Hackman herds bison. No, Bicycling.com. I was going to show it to you. It's, it's like a super skinny old Gene Hackman, and it's phenomenal. And uh, Gene Hackman's still alive. That's 88 great. years old, riding electric bikes in New Mexico. Dynamite. That's, that's what I learned from that. He probably lives in Santa Fe. I'll show you the picture. Or Taos. You'll be impressed. Apex Mountain, Tom Cruise? No. 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 Wilford Brimley? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, I don't know about that. that, feels, that feels Name strong. a more iconic Brimley performance. C- Cocoon is more iconic. <laughs> no, it's not. Yeah, I think it is. Because it's not the it's not the quintessence of Brimley. It's like weird Brimley. It's like he's doing stuff that's not normally what he is. Like it's the reason it works so well is because it's against type. Because you're like, this is the Quaker Oats guy. He's like my friendly grandfather, and he's so sinister. Yeah, and he's great. It's entertaining, and I would listen to you impersonate him on this podcast until I die. Heartbreak. <laughs> uh, the correct answer is uh, during the cocoon, the natural. Era. That run. That was when, okay. That was his apex. Gene Triplehorn, I would say yes, because Basic Instinct, her first movie, it's like, who's this? Then yeah. she's Tom Cruise's wife in a gigantic movie that makes a ton of money. And then Waterworld happens. Yes. yes. Big love, you can make case for, but no. Holly Hunter had this movie in the piano come out at the same time, 100% Apex Mountain. Yeah. Disagree. And you think you'd broadcast, say broadcast, news? News? broadcast News? Yeah. Is that broadcast was like her news breakout Arizona movie, though. the same year? No. I think Raising Arizona's first. I think winning an Oscar. Uh, Broadcast News is a perfect movie. And she's she's the reason it's perfect. Every time we see Bobby Wagner walking around, we have an engineer, podcast producer and engineer named Bobby Wagner. I always go, Bobby, 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 Bobby. Does this mean we can do a Broadcast News rewatchables? I don't know. That's like one of my 11 favorite movies ever. It's one of the greatest movies. Yeah. I wish wish, uh, you were two different people so I could tell my friend about this other person that I love so much. 
great God, line. God, Bill. James Brooks. It's a genius movie. It's a fucking great movie. I also would like to do a three hour podcast about William Hurt. <laughs> William Hurt in that movie. <laughs> Who's one, just one of the weirdest, most interesting William actors Hurt ever. Chill. He's so good in broadcast news. Incredible. Though. Perfect. It's like, is he dumb? Is it, it's like what you're talking about in All the President's Men with Redford, where it's like this vacant look. And it's like, is this guy smart? Is he dumb? And it turns out he's smart, but you think he's dumb the whole time. It's great. Holly Hunter, I vote yes. John Grisham, mm. I think yes. He's He's got three of the top six spots on the bestseller list. He's got a Tom Cruise movie. He's got seven more coming. And it seemed like he was the biggest uh, novelist to ever live. Same is the next. I think the same year as the Pelican Brief. The Pelican Brief's the year after. The year That's after Schumacher, right? It's Pelican. Oh, it's Pakula. That's right. Alan Pakula. Yeah. Just watched it. The Pelican Brief. How is it? Yeah. It's rough, man. It's 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 slow and it has some holes. It's not one of my favorites. Yeah, it's um, rough. Great, I great idea for a movie though. Yeah, like to take out two Supreme Court justices to swing whatever. And it's just like. Almost an impossible premise to screw up, and it's not very good. I'm not going to make a joke about the current administration, even though I could. <laughs> um, I, whew, You know what's crazy about Grisham, too? Even though this might have been his apex. Did you know he's written a book every single year since 1991? Yeah. Every single year he's put a book out. I think he has insane amounts of money. He must. Oh, I'm sure. I think he lives down south and just has, and like owns his own town. And, get, and is super charitable and does all the good stuff. Uh, John, what about John Grissom? <laughs> was this his apex he, round or no? He hit 237. Yeah, it was tough in being Grissom. the shadow of his brother Marquise Grissom. <laughs> was tough. Who would have been the best person for this movie? Danny Trejo, Steve Buscemi, or Michael K. Williams? I think Buscemi would have been a good, uh, like, like, hanging out with Tobin Bell and Dean Norris guy. Yeah. I vote for Treo because I think he could have been the Dean Norris character better. Get okay. shot in the knee and all that stuff. What about this swap Trejo for Brimley? Uh, <laughs> I don't think Tom Cruise's character is kicking the shit out of that bitch. guy. Bitch. <laughs> bitch. I had to do it, bro. The uh, Formerly the Mark Ruffalo they knew. Now the uh, Saul Rubinick, you stabbed me in the hut. Yeah. For overacting, this one's pretty easy, unfortunately. Busey? Busey, yeah. yeah. Busey doing the Elvis Aaron Hemphill speech. Just, this is a big heat check era for Busey coming off Point Break yeah. and him trying to reinvent himself as this crazy character actor. And this is when the wheels started to come off. He's just bad in this movie. He's one of the worst parts of this movie. Yeah. Picking nits. I never understood how Mitch just trusted Holly Hunter in like two seconds because somebody had recommended Busey, who was also like a fucking maniac. And a felon. Uh, and a, a bad guy. And then all of a sudden, Mitch is putting his life and everybody else's life in Holly Hunter's hands it was weird. And then it was weirder when his wife also decided the same thing. Hey, I met this weird lady who smokes Marlboro <laughs> Hundreds, who, who knows how to work a good fax. Honestly, though, if Holly Hunter at this time looking like that was like, I need you to do something for me, I'd be like, okay. Sure. Yeah. All right. Avery flipping and telling Abby everything. I just didn't get that. I still don't understand it. Prescription medication could be powerful. Yeah, I think he was uh, depressed. I think that's what you're supposed yeah. to take away. He's like in the middle of this like middle-aged spiral and he couldn't hold on. My biggest nitpick, why didn't the why wasn't the firm just following Mitch everywhere for like the last from basically the 40 minute mark of this movie on? He's taking he's like, I'm gonna go take a walk in the park. Like there should be somebody tailing him and Every point. I think that they're they are. He's doing a good job of covering his tracks. When he meets Holly Hunter in that diner, he's like sitting apart from her, you know, and they're talking kind of quietly to each other, but not looking at each other. So I think he's assuming that they're surveilling yeah. him. I, I don't know. Can we just like helicopter up above that? Like I, the plot of this movie, like the premise of this movie, doesn't make sense. Yeah. So this is the biggest problem: is that this guy is supposed to be the crackerjack lawyer of Harvard. He gets offered a job by Bandini, ba Lambert, and Locke which he's blown away by this like magic show where they put the thing in the envelope and he guesses. And then they like lease him a Mercedes. Does and he a, ever, ever ask who are the clients? No. And does he ever ask like, how does this place make its money? Does he ever ask anyone else? If the FBI has been investigating them for four years, you'd think that there would be some talk of they're a little bit crooked. And then the weird thing is, is that after he meets Sonny Caps in the Caymans, it's only after that that he's like, oh, now I see. You know what I mean? Like, if you see Sonny Caps, you're just like, I got to get on a plane and get the hell out of here. It's also not illegal to represent the mafia as a lawyer. Right. And 
even though it's implied that they're laundering money for the mob, like no law firm would launder money in this fashion. So th- this whole the the high level thinking to like create the conspiracy around this like it just doesn't really make any sense like why would lawyer why would they kill lawyers in the firm when lawyers in the firm would be bound by attorney client privilege to not reveal the information the same thing that that protects Mitch at the end of the movie is the reason why they would never kill lawyers who used to work there in the first place so it it kind of doesn't make sense at all this is why I never wanted to do this movie as a rewatchables <laughs> you motherfuckers. <laughs> I made all of these points to you. But that doesn't make it too not long and the plot is incomprehensible. You guys, that doesn't make it And you're like, no, we should do it. And finally you it's sucked me in really and that a- just picked it apart. No, three but minutes. of course it's fucking stupid. I mean, like the dinosaurs didn't come back and Jurassic Park's really rewatchable. <laughs> it's not like you can't, you can't like- You said to me today, this is a whole movie about Xeroxing and overbilling. That's incredible. <laughs> they made a movie with the biggest movie star in the world off of the biggest book in the world and it comes down to whether or not there's paper in a fax machine. Yeah. It's okay. great stuff. Yeah. One I'm not picking mad. it. I think he walks into Sorvino's hotel suite and, and he's gets just shot gunned down. down. It's Joe Pesci and Goodfellas. It's never like, hey, let's, <laughs> let's hear what Mitch has to say. Oh, I, no! just like, <laughs> <laughs> I think he walks in and is like, hey, it's Mitch McDear. <laughs> yeah. All right. Agreed. What are we, how are we getting rid of his body? They're not like, oh, let's, 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 hold on. Let's hear what he, let's hear about. Yeah. No way. Best quote. It's amazing how much you miss the sky is just a great quote. Mm-hmm. David Straithorn said that. <laughs> what do you think I am? The fucking night watchman? Incredible Brimley. Hey, Ray, wouldn't it be funny if I went to Harvard and you went to jail and we both ended up surrounded That's by crooks? Way. It's just a great quote. Probably I would also nominate favorite. everything Ed Harris says. How about you get down on your knees and kiss my ass for not indicting you as a co-conspirator right now, you chicken shit little Harvard cocksucker? I haven't done anything. You know it. Who gives a fuck? I'm a federal agent. You know what that means, you low-life motherfucker? You got no rights. Your life is mine. I could kick your teeth down your throat, yank them out your ass, or I'm not even violating your civil rights. Ed Harris has some good... Jesus, what are we doing? Louisiana! <laughs> <laughs> he might have been. He could have been a candidate for the Saul Rubin I mean, my Award. favorite line is, we'll take those steak sandwiches to go. Like, that's my, like, I, whatever, but... He has some incredible lines, like when he gets caught on the wire being like, you little Harvard cocksucker. Like, like yeah. he's, he's really good in this movie. Probably unanswerable questions. We hit most Boldly of them. Boldly bald, too. Interesting. It's an interesting look for him. That's finally when he went, yeah, he went bald. He went full-fledged, yeah. right? Yeah, but he brings it back, you know, in, in The Rock and stuff like that. We did all the unanswerable I questions. I have one unanswerable question. Well, I have, I have one, too, so okay. you do yours first. Well, I just want to know what happens to Lamar. Like where, where Terry Kinney's character seems like he's going to play a much bigger he role in this movie. Us. <laughs> he goes to us. <laughs> he becomes a prison guard. <laughs> Wait, you guys didn't talk about they don't own me and you don't own me. That quote. Oh yeah. At oh, the that's end of the good. Movie, I that's, to put that one but in. that's from Thief. That's yeah, lifted stole, directly from Thief. Yeah. That's I was the first one. person who ever liked Thief. Okay. You were the first I, yes. person who Nobody ever liked even Thief. knew that movie was out. Well, how was, do you document something I was like that? On that cable, I'm like, this movie's great. <laughs> but where, like, I'm like, who's who? with me? Who was a witness? It's like Did 1983. You? I'm like, I'm looking around, going, who's with me on Thief? Nobody. Crickets. In I was like, Michael Mann. Yep. Meanwhile, I'm one years old on Long Island. And yeah, thinking, fantasy was I'm there. He's in 20 years, and I'm going <laughs> to love the shit out of it. Fantasy is breastfeeding. Um, <laughs> Miami Vice is coming. I'm like, the guy who did Thief is doing that dope. <laughs> <I'm in." laughs> <laughs> I love that guy. How did you even? What do you mean? They didn't say that. Like, where did you read that? <laughs> no, he was my. He was Jericho Mile and Thief. No, and I, I love both of those. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. believe he had done the Keep at that point. No, too. he was part of the Miami Vice hype when it was coming out. Michael Man, Mann was. was. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Well, hadn't he yeah. done Crime Story too at that point? No, it was after. It's so after. I just want to know. Just I mean, you guys aren't really taking my bait here, but like, why is Lamar introduced as this big character? We we have that like iconic image of him sitting with a, a Heineken with the cap still on while the sprinklers are going on his khakis and he's like, their twins were just a year younger than my boy, and then he just kind of vanishes midway I think through. He gets, it's because it's because it's because the movie is too fucking long already. And they couldn't <laughs> stick him tie up Lamar's plot. In every movie, needs like a schnooky regular guy as Kevin his Pollock. Kevin Pollock, Kevin yeah, Pollock yeah, yeah, yeah. Goose. Like there's always in the first 10 years of his career, there's always a guy who's like kind of his buddy, but is a loser and has a tragic thing happen. Dustin to him. Hoffman. So does Lamar not know that they're a mafia law firm? He's a, he's a poorly written character. Does, and like, I really what? regret doing the rewatchables though. <laughs> <laughs> Lamar, Lamar's character has no arc. I have no idea why he's in the movie. Uh, no, he's great. Love Terry Kinney. Uh, 
Unanswerable. What's the best John Grissom? John Grisham movie. John it's Grisham. not answerable. It's this. M- my most sen- my sentimental favorite is the client, which I think I've mentioned on this show before. That uh, gets the the uh, artsy fartsy movie critic circles that you like to surround yourself <laughs> with. That that's usually the go to. Surround myself. That's what? usually the go to <laughs> one when you're like on your your uh, your text chain with A O Scott and I, I can. 